We were all born as scientists and artists. As children, we loved to draw, to sculpt, to write poetry. We held a wonder for the world. We wanted to know what really happened to those bubbles in the bathtub, or why our friend could make the perfect paper airplane and ours would always do a nose dive. We wondered also whether snowflakes really were all different. Who can fail to see the science and the art in a picture of a snowflake or a field of snowflakes? I can see it in my kids every day, that wonder for science. And I have a confession to make. I am a science-aholic. I am a laser jock, a nano geek, a biophysical chemist. I love science. I love the thrill of discovery. And being a scientist for a career is like solving crossword puzzles every day of your life. But somewhere along the way, somewhere some of us lost that thread, and science wasn't so thrilling anymore. It could be because in grade school, science started to get associated with a little bit of failure, with challenges that seemed insurmountable, with bad grades. Science got associated with not knowing instead of with knowing. And that fear, fear of not knowing, fear of failing, possibly crept into growing trepidation about technology today. And, and te technology today can be overwhelming, absolutely. Whether it's GMOs that could be leading to so-called frankenfoods, climate change, um, the internet, which has the potential to replace schools, or in, in fact, the field that I study, nanotechnology. So I wondered, how can we get our science geek back on? How can we move towards a place where we're actually excited about science again and where we're not trepidatious or fearful about it? So I, I say to you that enter the, this world of science and technology not with, with fear, but arming yourself with knowledge, real, logical knowledge. And how did I come to this conclusion? Ironically, not by thinking about it scientifically, but, but by listening to my own inner artist as I struggled to let that loose. So, as a kid, I listened to a lot of music. I reveled in waiting for school to be over, get back home, crank up my parents' stereo, possibly to 11 if there was such a number on the dial, to the point where Often as I was rocking out air guitar to the Beatles or Black Sabbath or Deep Purple, uh, my parents' car would come into the garage. Unbeknownst to me, because the music was so loud, my mother would appear behind me and basically scare the living daylights out of me. And you'd think a kid would learn, but it wasn't the only time that I was caught doing that. As time went on, um, I learned how to play the drums. I joined at 11 a small band, a small band of ruffians. We were doing covers of Kiss, BTO, Hendrix, The Stones. But still, always somewhere behind me was this feeling of wanting to play the air guitar again, and maybe even trading that air guitar in for a real guitar. And maybe I was just getting tired of the jokes. You know, what do you call a guy that hangs out with a bunch of musicians? A drummer. Yeah. <laughs> Or in the heyday of the Beatles, when John Lennon was asked, is Ringo Starr the best drummer in the world? And Lennon quipped, best drummer in the world? He's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I approached the 47th anniversary of my birthday, some would call it approaching the so-called midlife crisis. Um, I ventured down to a local guitar shop, bought myself acoustic, an acoustic guitar, and decided to try and teach myself how to play. Fast forward three years or so from then, so now you know how old I am. <laughs> three years, several guitars, a number of amplifiers, a synthesizer, uh, the old drum set, a spouse that's incredibly patient and often earplugged. <laughs> children who sometimes say it sounds like a monster in the basement, um, 
That, that's today. Um, I've composed and put out there in the, the internet um, over, over 70 so-called songs. And there is fear associated with that process, not unlike the fear and trepidation that some folks might feel towards technology. So, so where is Dave going with this story? Okay, so the 1,200 hours is approximately how much time it feels like I've put in um, to learning how to, how to make music. And I compare that with the 50,000 hours that I've put in listening to music. So the fear gets squashed down a little bit because I have an innate sense, having listened to that much music, of, of what decent music is. Everybody in this audience has put in thousands of hours of being exposed to technology. You know what it's like, and you have an innate sense of when you're hearing something that sounds true or sounds like maybe it isn't true. So how do you, how do you get into that? How do you get the, the science geek, your mojo back? How do you let that lab rat out of purgatory? I believe it's simply returning to the wonder of science that you once had, putting in some real time to do that. So let's go on a little journey about how, how that could happen, and I'll use some examples from the research that we do in my research group. Um, so talk a little bit about nanotechnology. Um, it's complicated because we both study uh, the, the good and the um, not so good of nanotech, how it can serve to um, help with the treatment of cancer. Also, the fact that there could be things that are nano-sized um, that are actually dangerous and toxic. So I've found when trying to understand science, or anything new for that matter, um, using analogies, bringing it back to things that I know. So uh, when tumors develop, they grow to a certain size, and then they need to recruit blood vessels to them in order to keep growing. Those blood vessels are new, and therefore the walls in the blood vessels are leaky. Things can leak out of them. Those leaks are kind of the same size as the nanoparticles we study. To put it into context, um, if the blood vessel was a commuter train, then the people on the train would be the, blood, the red blood cells. And then the nanoparticles, by comparison, would be like specks of dust on the train. And on a hot, sweaty summer day, the vents are open. The dust particles can get out, but the people can't. And so we try and exploit properties of those particles to get them out of the blood vessels into the tumor. And we found that simple things like size really matter, as it turns out. <laughs> at least in this application. <laughs> um, and charge, so the static, the static electricity of the, of the nanoparticle. So thinking about things in terms of what you're familiar with, the train and the, and the people on the train, can help in trying to understand science. Trying to understand the risk in science is important as well. Um, so folks have probably heard about carbon nanotubes, these nano-sized needles of carbon. They sort of look like um, asbestos fibers, and therefore, they do have the potential to cause asbestos-like reactions um, when organisms are exposed to them. So how do we handle uh, the risk? Can we be confident that this isn't a problem, or we, do we need to be scared about this? So a simple equation can help us understand that. Um, risk equals toxicity times exposure. Uh, the toxicity is the inherent nastiness of the, the substance that we're thinking about, and the exposure is the odds that the organism will actually encounter that, that substance. So for example, um, the smartphones that you all have, possibly tweeting at this very moment, um, have toxic materials in them. But the odds of you ingesting your smartphone are very, very low. <laughs> Hopefully for most of you. Okay, so th that's sort of how I think about science and try and use analogies to, to get me through um, sticky points. Um, so where can, where can everybody start? Where can all citizens um, get back into becoming a more critical analyst of the science and technology that's, that's out there that you're basically bombarded with um, every day? So you can't necessarily become a scientist, um, although some of you might have some science going on in your garage, or if you have... Uh, sons that are of the age of 18, you might have some science going on in the fridge or their fridge. But you can read science by the experts. How do you pick out where to go to read? Um, the big important journals like Science and Nature 
are great places to start. So these, the articles that are uh, written for these, these publications are meant to be very approachable. And I have, uh, I'm going to read for you the abstract from, from one and, a, and one sentence out of it, just to give you a feeling for what you're up against here. Um, and maybe this will spark some conversation about um, he's crazy or, yeah, that wasn't bad. Okay, so not, not one of my publications. This is about uh, cancer. So the title is The DNA Damage Response in Human Biology and Disease. Authors Steve Jackson and Jiri Bartek. So here comes the, the abstract. The prime objective of every life form is to deliver its genetic material intact and unchanged to the next generation. This must be achieved despite constant assaults by endogenous and environmental agents on the DNA. To counter this threat, life has evolved several systems to detect DNA damage, signal its presence, and mediate its repair. Such responses, which have an impact on a wide range of cellular events, are biologically significant because they prevent diverse human disease. Our improving understanding of DNA damage responses is providing new avenues for disease management. So this is a review article, and that abstract actually sounds pretty approachable. Um, I hope you would agree, or at least 50% of you. Okay, so that's the abstract, that's the hook. Um, so let's get into some of the meat. So a um, couple of sentences into this paper. Some DNA aberrations arise via physiological processes, such, such as mis mismatches occasionally, see I can't even say it, it's so complicated. Occasionally introduced during DNA replication and DNA strand breaks caused by abortive topoisomerase 1 and topoisomerase 2 activity. Whew. <laughs> yeah, we'll just put that one away. So, so clearly, it, it's going to take some time and energy to get yourself back into this. But as a scientist, I can assure you that it sounds complicated, but there are definitions for every term that I mention. It will be a, a journey that you have to take. And if, if there's a universal truth that I've learned um, in my 50-odd years of being a scientist and my three-odd years of attempting to be a musician, um, is that you have to put the time in to get better at something. So you're going to have to put your brave shoes on, go and grab a journal, um, get yourself a library card at your local college or university, go online, search a subject that you're passionate about and dive into it. Um, you can create your own hypotheses once your understanding starts to get beefed up. Um, you and you can test them by looking for answers to those hypotheses in the literature. If you get stuck, we're here. The profs and the researchers at universities and colleges are just an email or a phone call or a cup of coffee away to talk about things. And you'll, you'll find a real resonance um, in your growing a desire to understand technology um, is actually the same, same as ours. So, like uh, the inexperienced but passionate uh, guitarist, you can get your mojo back for science by simply diving into it. You can force yourself to not be cynical about technology. You can bring wonder back into science in your lives. You can be curious and you can let your curiosity lead you. <laughs>